Yes, sir. What's up, brother? How are you? What's up, bro? What's good? Good to finally see you off the basketball court, man. I know, man. I know, <laughs> man. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready, bro. All right. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Cut. We're coming different today, and it's going to be special. Usually I'm in the barbershop, but because it's locked down in Melbourne, I can't be there. I was gonna fly down to see my brother who we about to interview today, and um, we couldn't do it. So we had to come up with a unique way to be able to interview this special gentleman, and today we're gonna get it done. It's NADOC week. We wanna give my brother his roses today. We wanna raise awareness of indigenous history, culture, and the achievements. And I wanted to make sure Foot Lock and I collaborated to speak to this brother right here because everything I just said is all that he represents. And this is my man, Nate Jawai. How you doing, brother? I'm good, bro. Good to have me on the cut, bro. It's exciting to see you. Yeah, man, I love that smile, man. And that's the most beautiful thing about you, man. You just always, you're a gentle giant when you're off the court. You're just a sweet individual, you know what I mean? I remember when we first played against each other, you might've been 19 years old. Oh my goodness, it's such a long time ago, but um, you know, you played hard as hell on the court because you know that's how we approach it. But off the court, man, you're just a kind, nice human. So take us back to your roots in the early days of Nate Jawai and his journey. Who is Nate Jawai? Uh, Nate Jawai. I'm growing up in the community called Bamiga. Um, it's a strong rugby league town. Um, I guess that's where my toughness comes from. Age. 16, Uncle Danny Moshua, who um, played in the NBL, represent Australia, um, came up to Birmingham and recruited me down to play basketball. Um, I took part in that for a year and then moved over to the Cairns Marlins. And um, at that point, I didn't really know I was going to be a professional basketball. You know, coming out of the community, it was, it was tough. Um, English is my second language into a foreign city. You know, I haven't grown up in the city before. Uh, Home is only 2,000 people in the area, um, so it's tough, it was different, you know. Um, moving from Birmingham to Cairns um, was an eye-opener for me. Um, didn't know what was ahead of me, you know. Talk to me about, you know, your role as an indigenous athlete. You are the first indigenous Aussie to ever play in the NBA. So talk to me about that role that you represent. Going in there, representing my people, experiencing different culture, different competition and to to be the first indigenous basketball player to play in the NBA it's something that I'll never take for granted it's it's, it's a special thing that I hold close to my heart um, and, and I share when I go back to the community um, just to the young ones you know just to say um, if I can do it from a community that's with 2,000 people you can do whatever you can you know so NADOC week tell me what that means to you and also what you want non-indigenous people to get out of it? Um, for non-Indigenous people, it's more education. It's, it's to come together and celebrate the multicultural um, that we have in this country. You know, um, there's a whole, a whole lot of culture here. We have the oldest um, culture on the planet. It's a week for us to remember our past, um, what people go to see our Uncle Koiki Mabo, um, and what it means to protect our land, our sea, and, and the rich culture that we share. When did you know you were on the radar for the NBA, like, like, talk to us about that experience and who really helped you when you were with the Cans Tight Pants to like have you truly believe you can make it to the NBA? I mean, to be honest with you, at that time I had no idea that I had interest from the NBA or I could make it. I was just focusing on playing for the Tight Pants at that point. You know, we played against each other a few times that year. And unfortunately, it was a game in Townsville where I kind of got the scout from the Raptors. Jim Kelly came out um, <laughs> and first spoke to me. I remember that game. You kicked our ass. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, that game um, probably put me on the, on the map. Um, I was young. I had no idea about it. I had no experience on how to carry myself at that point. Just to have that. Um, exposure to the NBA and someone to fly out to come in and see me um, kind of made me think a little bit that I could make it. So let's fast forward. Let's talk about the, the, the traditional big man, right? That's, that's who you are. Talk to us about how your game at your position, most guys now are like shooting the three. 
how, how, how did you see the game like transition from the biggest guy that's always in the paint now majority of them wanting to shoot shoot threes all the time I mean it's different you know I was fortunate enough to play with Andre Bagnani from Italy and he was shooting threes he was a big guy and I think that's where it kind of started when I was in Toronto um, there was not, not a whole lot of banging going on down there um, he was always wanted to be on the three-point line it kind of was labeled as soft but the game has evolved where now all NBA guys are sh shooting three, all big men. I love what I do in the paint and that's what I've been taught from the age of 17 when I first started. And I still like to do it now, but to see guys stepping out shooting threes, you can see how the game is changing and it's getting tougher, you know, because I'm the one that has to step out there and <laughs> coverage and, you know, pump fake and, you know, getting blown by. So it's changing hard. <laughs> True or false, do you hate the name Baby Shaq? <laughs> Shaq of Australia. You know, it, it's a it's a controversial one for me. It's because you know I was I was young. I was 19 coming in to play NBL. Um, I'm Australian. I'm dark because I'm indigenous and I'm dark and I'm kind of speaking up about it more because I'm more comfortable with it now. Um, I kind of see the kind of a race thing because I'm Australian. I'm black um, and it kind of didn't fit well with me and I just didn't have that confidence to speak up about it way I could say I don't like it because of that, you know, obviously back then it was different to now. Um, obviously I can talk more about it openly in public now. The Outback Shack thing kind of didn't sit with me well. Um, I didn't really speak about it. It's the first time I said something about it. But you know, there's kids sometimes I, I go out and they're like, Baby Shack, uh, Outback Shack. And I, I get angry inside, but you know, when you see kids sitting on the sideline coming to watch an entertainment game of basketball, yeah. I just put a smile on my face and yeah, move on. As of this day, that name is done. We done with that. Yes, please. You made it clear. We done with that. Now, um, the NBL, you play with Cans, and now you're playing NBL 1. Foot Locker has collaborated with the NBL 1. You're playing NBL 1, and obviously you play NBL with Cans. So how cool is it that Foot Locker has partnered up and got on board with the NBL? Yeah, it's cool. You know, it's like I said, the game is growing in Australia. Um, it's getting more recognition. You know, I played back in the days ABA and we never had anything like that. And one was the closest thing, I think. And to have something like a major brand as Foot Locker supporting NBL One and, and showing interest in, in the league, it's just the growth, showing you the growth of the NBL um, on a global stage, I guess. But it's good, you know, like I said, the opportunities from what we had when we were playing back in the days is not there. So it's, it's great to see these things getting in place um, for the future basketballs coming through the ranks. The Boomers, do you think they'll have a chance, they'll, they'll medal this time around? They've been close a lot. Do you feel that they'll, they'll medal this time? Of course I do, they're my brothers. Um, like I said before, I've grown up with them. Um, they seem dedicated. Um, I chat to the boys still, and just the togetherness and, and the chemistry that they have as a brotherhood, uh, I think we'll get them across the line. Um, we have a few NBA players now. Um, we have unreal talent in the NBL. Like I said, NBL is one of the best league and I think we have a chance to go out there and get a medal. And I think we're in a better form now than we was a couple of years ago and we're just gonna get closer to it and we're gonna be rewarded with the Olympic medal, hopefully. Patty Mills, talk to me about your relationship with Patty, all he continues to do for the community and for his people. Talk to me about the impact of Patty Mills. Hey, his, his impact is massive. Obviously, the IBA working with the NBL, um, having a competition for young indigenous kids throughout Australia. Um, not even that, his charity work with the bushfires last year, um, his work over in the States. His voice is recognized throughout all of Australia and even in the States. Um, he's a god, you know, for our people. Um, he's doing unreal thing. He's representing the culture, practicing island dancing before the Olympics, showing that passion. It's something that we all like to see and, and you know, all the community up here and around Australia cannot wait to see him go out there and, and get us the gold medal, but just his, his impact to us means everything. He's a special person. Thank you for your time, my brother. I know you're a busy man and um, I appreciate your time. Good luck in the future. Keep smiling, bro. We'll do for sure. Thank you, you very much. Keep smiling. You keep doing your thing and you keep representing. We'll do, man. Nothing but love, bro. Thank, Thank you, you for your time, man. Thank you. See you, mate. Thank you.